This Week in Startups is brought to you by LinkedIn. When you're hiring, LinkedIn Jobs matches you with the people who fit your role the best. Post a job today at linkedin.com slash twist and get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. InVision. Get InVision for startups with unlimited users on the full suite of InVision tools plus enterprise-level security and support at InVision.com slash twist. That's I-N-V-I-S-I-O-N dot com slash twist. And Carda. Simplify how you manage equity with Carda. To get 20% off Carda's cap table software and 409A valuations, go to Carda.com slash twist. That's C-A-R-T-A dot com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another This Week in Startups. This is the podcast where I talk to entrepreneurs, investors, pundits, authors, people in the technology business and the entrepreneurial space about how to build companies and how they want to see the world change through the lens of startups. That's why we call it This Week in Startups. We've been doing this for 10 years. And one of my favorite formats of show that we do here is I'll ask one of my friends who runs an accelerator or an incubator to bring me you know, part of their cohort part of their class and say, let me meet these new companies. And it really is the best part about being an angel investor. When you're an angel investor, you get to see all these new ideas being tried in the world. And you get to meet the founders when they have two, three, four employees, team members ready to take on the world. Boy, is that exciting. Because you know what? Sometimes they actually do change the world. So uh, my friend Stoney Baptiste is with a venture firm called Urban.us. He specializes uh, in technology and startups that will help cities and urban environments. And he has a very cool accelerator with a theme. It's called Urban-X, and it was created uh, with the support of Mini in order to support founders uh, working to make city life better, which a Mini does. Uh, my first, The first new car I ever bought, my first car was a Mustang 73 Grande in gold. I paid six fifty for that. It had a hole in the driver in the passenger seat. Uh, that you could look and see the streets of Brooklyn through. And then my second car, in the second year, when I first moved to L.A., the Mini Cooper came out, and the reviews were so stunning that I bought a Mini Cooper, and I loved it. Now I drive only Teslas, but hey, what can you do? Uh, I'm in Silicon Valley. I'm contractually obligated as an angel investor in Silicon Valley to drive a Tesla. So first up is a company called Toggle, and the CEO, or co-founder, Co-founder and CEO. Co-founder and CEO is named Dan Blank. He's super excited. He's ready to go. He's going to give us a three-minute pitch. Now, remember, most people are listening. So if you say, Dan, hey, and as you can see on the screen here, it's pretty exciting. We don't know what you're talking about if we're listening. So you got to do a little bit of the old sports casting. Right. So if something happens on the screen, go feel free to describe it. What you're seeing here is X, Y, and Z. All right. Uh, and his company is called Toggle. You can go visit it at Toggle, T-O-G-G-L-E dot is, I-S. Three, two, go. All right. So we're a construction robotics company. And reinforced concrete is the most ubiquitous building material in construction. And the concrete, which is what you see on the left there, has rebar inside of it, steel bars, which give it its structural integrity. And together, reinforced concrete is actually consumed in greater quantity than any other material on the planet besides water. And that's because it's the fundamental building block of all large-scale construction. And large-scale construction is accelerating. Due to global urbanization, the cities that we're building are becoming larger and more complex. And we're also investing in new infrastructure. We're rehabilitating old infrastructure. So it's creating massive demand for reinforced concrete in this building material. But if you look at the way that we build with it, it really hasn't changed. So you can see a construction site here on the left from 1957, one in the present here in 2017. And the process of manually assembling rebar really hasn't changed at all for generations. And so in this video, you can really see the problem. You have a team of five uh, construction workers struggling to get individual bars into place to form a cage, which makes up the inside of a, a column. And the problem is that this method is incredibly slow, inefficient, and it's actually dangerous for the workers involved. So if we don't find a better way to do this, we'll never fulfill that global demand. And so at Toggle, the solution that we've created is to bring industrial robotics and automation from the manufacturing industry into construction so we can actually automate the way that we cut, bend, and assemble this material, and we can ship finished rebar cages to the construction site where they're installed and they're covered in concrete. 
And so our solution is a full stack solution, meaning that we do hardware, software, and services, and it's in our own factory in Brooklyn. Um, and so we've patented the entire system and process. And what you see here on the hardware side are two industrial robots with the hardware that we've created to work around them. So a gripper, a robotic wire tying process, which is how we secure the bars together, and then a reconfigurable fixture, which is what allows us to switch rapidly between different shapes and sizes of rebar cages, which is really critical and, and gives us an advantage. And so on the software side, we take uh, the data out of a CAD file um, and we translate it into robotic motion plan. So that's what allows the robot to do the work. And so by creating an entirely digital workflow, we eliminate the need for paper shop drawings and so we don't lose any data. And so altogether, what this translates into between the time savings, the cost savings can be over a million dollars for a single high rise building for the developer or general contractor. And this model is already working for us. We have paid pilots on two prominent New York City infrastructure projects, and we're adding partners in the steel and construction industry every month. And together with these partners, we've already built a $30 million pipeline for our first factory. And factories are how we initially think about the market opportunity. So with a single factory in New York, we can serve a 300 mile radius and generate $50 million in revenue. We then scale that to 27 cities and then five global markets. It's a 1.4 billion and then $7 billion opportunity. And All right. Well done. And you've got Thank a you. team that's awesome. Yes. Uh, we'll give them a high five. Uh, all right. I'll give you a little golf clap for that, everybody in the studio Thank you. audience. Very nice. Thank you. You had me at construction plus robots. I'll tell you why. If you were to pick how much innovation disruption has happened in an industry like construction, it would be a low amount. Right. It's actually the lowest of any industry. Uh, some might argue that... Um, other industries such as healthcare and education also haven't changed much. So when you give your pitch about, hey, here's construction in 1957 versus 2017, I see the same exact pitch with kids in a classroom from 200 years ago when they're sitting in rows of eight, nice and neatly. So uh, healthcare probably is in third place, but some might argue construction and education are the two that need to change the most. And robotics is something that has come down in complexity and the software's become more robust and the arms have become 90% cheaper than they were two decades ago or just a decade ago? What is the well, drop up in? That that giant arm you have there is a $30,000, $40,000 arm? It's about $30,000. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I just guessed it, but uh, I do this for a living. I see these robots all the time because this, uh, Cafe X uses a similar robot that's half the price, but it's half the size. That's right. a big robot. It is. That's a 12-foot robot, 12 feet or so? It has about a 15-foot reach. Okay. Uh, so about 12 feet, a uh, 15-foot reach, and that costs 30000 What would that robot have costed in 19... Uh, 99, 20 years ago. Likely $200,000. And So it's come down almost 90%, hasn't it? Yeah. That is incredible. Um, now, here's a stupid question for you. I understand what you're doing with the rebar. You're bending it and you're tying it together to make the frame. Correct? Right. So here's a stupid question. Why... Are we still using rebar? Isn't there another material that would be easier to use and just as strong? I'm just thinking first principles here. You said earlier your premise was like, we're still doing it the same way. Right. And I get that concrete is still like on a cost basis, really good. But is rebar really the best solution for this? Or is there some better material that would go in to reinforce the concrete? Well, there's a lot of people working on that in academia, and there are some interesting leads, but nothing could offer the same uh, cost a benefit of steel and the same structural qualities. So we're still a long way off from in replacing reinforced concrete with steel reinforcement. There are some things coming up, but nothing that can support the structural scale you need for a bridge or for a power plant. or. What a are they working building. on? Some like nanotechnology kind of? Well, you have some uh, carbon and composite materials uh, that are interesting. You also have micro rebar, which rather than being a continuous bar is like lots of little pieces spread out inside the concrete. Uh, but again, none of it has gotten to a point where it could be adopted at scale. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about taking the risk to be the first bridge made out of that stuff, that's a barrier to using the new the new materials as yeah, well. Yeah, I don't think you want to build that bridge. 
Um, so what is the challenge of this business? What, do you, what is the biggest challenge you face? Is it the unions and adoption? Is it... No, actually, at this phase, it's really the capital stack, because especially going into the venture-backed world, we look a lot like a manufacturing business. We have things like inventory and factories and capital equipment. Mm -hmm. So we're actually looking at combining a more traditional manufacturing capital stack that involves debt with venture capital for developing the technology and advancing our R&D. Hiring is so hard. You are suffering right now, and I understand that. I'm suffering too. I've got to hire people. I've got 200 portfolio companies. We're all trying to hire talent and it's a record low unemployment here in America. Well, I have the solution for you and you are already using this product. It's called LinkedIn, but LinkedIn has a great new feature. It's called LinkedIn jobs. It helps you fill all these open positions you have. 500 million people are active on LinkedIn. You know that. And they come every day to meet connections, to grow their careers, to discover new job opportunities. 90% of LinkedIn users, according to a survey, are open to new opportunities, but uh, they are not actively looking. These are called passive job searchers. LinkedIn jobs gives you access to an entirely different demographic than anywhere else in the world. In fact, we found our director, Sir Charles, and our marketing manager, Maureen, on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is amazing and you need LinkedIn jobs to find the right person for your business. You're gonna get to target your job promotion. It's gonna recommend matches and you really need that candidate management so that you have this beautiful, elegant dashboard and it will track everybody from application to hire so you don't lose any of those premium candidates. LinkedIn jobs uses knowledge of both hard skills, cloud computing, social media, video productions, and soft skills like collaboration, time management, to match you with people who fit your role best. I want you to go to linkedin.com slash twist, linkedin.com. It's already in your URL filler. It'll automatically fill linkedin.com. All I need you to do is put slash T-W-I-S-T. Can you do that for me? Slash twist and get 50, a 50 from jcal. Go get your 50 for your first job posting. That's linkedin.com slash twist. Terms and conditions, of course, apply. Thank you, LinkedIn, for helping us find Sir Charles and Maureen. They have been crushing it for us. Let's get back to this amazing podcast. Mm. So you have to make an outlay for the robots. Right. And that is something you think venture capital doesn't understand or they don't understand the construction industry and your customers and the margin. What is it that they don't like? Well, it's a little bit of both. They do assume yeah. that it's a low margin business. And so, mm -hmm. you know, all of this money tied up in inventory and, you know, accounts receivable isn't going to be a good use of, uh, you know, it's not capital efficient. Um, but also just that combination. They say, well, you're going to be taking on debt to finance those things. Where do we as equity holders fall, you know, in the capital stack when yeah. you start to get I money mean, back? But there's equipment leasing. And there is, I yeah. bet you the people who make those robot arms would extend you. Mm-hmm. Have they extended you some uh, We have terms? been able to lease uh, robots, and there are a lot of equipment uh, lessers out there. Um, yeah. So it's it's a mix. That's really what you know it comes down to. It's not just a straight you know software venture backed play. It's it's really a hybrid. Now, are you're actually going to make the rebar? Uh, what do you call them? Forms or something? What are they? Called? Cages. Cages. You're yeah. going to make the rebar cages yourself. Exactly. You're not selling your system to a no. company. No. Why We're, not? Why, why did you make that decision to actually make these cages as opposed to sell the robot and the software to somebody and let them make the cages and just take a license fee? I'm curious. Well, on the one hand, the legacy industry, you know, is doing it a certain way and to ask them to adapt that in the middle of their business by, you know, taking on this new technology mm -hmm. is, a, is a, you know, high bar. And so if we do it ourselves, we can run a really efficient process. We can iterate on the technology as we go and we can have much higher productivity than we if we try to train someone else to do it. So you're selling into a contractor or a concrete manufacturer. Who do you sell to? Typically the concrete company. Got in, it. in some cases, the GC or even the developer if it's a large enough uh, project. Got it. So the developer might say, we want you to use the solution because we want to go faster and cheaper. Exactly, yeah. And they'll force their concrete subcontractor to use it. Yes. Huh, that's fascinating. Um, any questions for me? I'm curious. I would be curious what you think the biggest challenge will be to get this into the market. 
the unions, I would think, and the mob, uh, <laughs> candidly, uh, from what I understand, like uh, I'm, I'm being slightly facetious. Um, but, you know, sometimes you're up against incumbents yep. and they're used to doing it a certain way. I'm joking about the mafia, but um, some people might refer to the teachers unions as a bit right. of a mafia in New York as well, where, you know, Michael Bloomberg kind of looked at them as something he had to crack because they were protecting, you know, the status quo and they weren't innovating. And so having this, having the gains from this technology accrue to the companies um, that are making money already, I think is a wise decision. Because if you're saying to them, listen, this is going to save you a third of the time or make you a third more effective, and you can charge the same, or you could charge more because you're going to be faster and better. Right. Um, if they can share in that uh, percentage, then you're going to have a lot more um, benefit. In, in a way, if you think about Uber on the high end with the luxury cars, mm -hmm. the cab companies up top, you know, the livery companies, I think they called them, uh, which were providing the Lincoln Town Car Service, like Carry Car Service, they were taking upwards of 40, 50%. And there weren't that many people who would ride in those cars. So those drivers didn't do a lot of rides. When they did, it was very expensive and half the money went to the car service. Now they get 75% of the money and they do many more rides. So in aggregate, I think they make more money um, because it's accessible to more people. So that's the thing you have to think about is, are you displacing somebody or are you empowering somebody? What do you think you're doing right now? Are you displacing the concrete company or are you empowering them? That, that subcontractor. What do right. you think you're doing right now? Well, we think about it as increasing productivity, that we're enabling the producers to get more with the same amount of resources. So, Producers you know, being the company that does concrete and rebar? Well, being the rebar industry, but also being the labor itself. Mm. You know, the labor uh, force is very constrained in construction. Oh, is it? It is, and it's getting tighter. And so what we want to be able to do is actually allow the same number of workers to produce more construction. Ah, so this is one of these sort of situations where the pie is getting so big. There is so much construction going on in the world. So much of the world is being rebuilt that you're not going to eliminate 20% of the workforce. You're going to let them catch up on all the jobs that they can't take advantage of. Exactly. So I think that's the important thing is that's why I asked you who you sell into. And I think you're right. Most venture capitalists are going to make it an easy pass on your company because they'll go, well, I don't, we were not in this business. But you don't need to get all of them. You need to get but one. Mm -hmm. And so I would just be prepared for, you know, 39 no's and one yes. And the seed uh, funds are much more likely because they're, you know, they're going to put in a 500K or a million dollar check. They're going to be much more likely to back something like this. Uh, in the same way, I was much more likely to back Uber or Robinhood or Calm or Cafe X or Blockable, which before I invested... I think the traditional VCs took a little bit of a wait and see, like, this seems a little crazy. Uh, let's see if they can get to 10 or 20 or 30, you know, Cafe X locations or 20 or 30 blockable units for, you know, modular housing. So I would be very patient with yourself. I would celebrate the victories and I would knock it out of the park with those first couple of trials, knowing that the real investors in the world are going to talk to those customers. You might be able to clear market and get by with like some dipshit angel putting in 100K or 250K and not doing diligence, but be prepared. When you start getting to the, the, the bigger firms, the more serious ones, the ones who've really done successful work in backing startups and founders, the Sequoias, the Benchmark, the Chamath, Polyopatias, uh, Mamuna, Kleiner, whoever it happens to be, uh, David Sachs at Kraft, they're going to talk to your customers. They're going to go visit the customers. And you want to make sure that you've delighted them and have alignment with them. So I think that's my best advice for you is to just overperform. Right. It's not about how many customers you have. It's about how essential you are to the number of customers you have. I'd rather see you have three customers who can't shut up about you than have 15 and they feel, that's eh, okay. It's interesting. I think it's, yeah, maybe it will work. Maybe it won't. Just overperform for those customers so you get these what people might call a lighthouse customer mm -hmm. through all the fog and the newness of this there's this bright beaming you have to do this it's amazing i can't live without uber 
right? There were people who were just, you remember the early days of Tesla or Uber, where people were like, you, I, this is incredible. It's the greatest thing ever. It changes everything. And you're like, okay, calm down. I'll, I'll download Uber. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try uh, Yammer. I'll try Slack. Yes, it's a chat room. Okay, I get it's better. All right, good luck with it. And we'll be right back. Hey, everybody, welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. And I'm doing one of the things I love to do, meet new founders and hear about their vision for the world. Next up is Circuit. They are doing free shuttle services at ridecircuit.com. Alex is the co-founder. Why don't you tell me about the company for three minutes? And remember, some people are listening, so describe what they're seeing. Three, two, go. Uh, hi, I'm Alex Esposito, co-founder of Circuit, formerly known as the Free Ride. We're an all-electric free local shuttle service. We focus on downtown congested areas and have given over two and a half million rides since starting. Over a third of all vehicle trips in this country are under three miles, yet there still aren't great options for short distances. AVs aren't quite ready, scooters aren't for everyone, and traditional rideshare services can cause traffic when used in sh use short distances in downtown environments, uh, knowing the cities are doing everything they can to try to get people out of their cars. We have a simple solution that works. We use an all electric fleet of cars and a ride request app. If you're anywhere within our geo-fenced coverage area, normally about zero to two miles, you can catch a ride and it's free. We then use the data to make the system smarter and uh, work with advertisers and cities to pay for it. We know the solution works because we were the first of its kind. We, my business partner and I, uh, solved the congestion problem in our hometown of East Hampton. Uh, we use that model. It's a proven model that we've bootstrapped and expanded around the country. Uh, we're now in 20 co- 20 plus locations and have given uh, um, and over 150 cars. People really love the service. Uh, it's free, of course, which they like, but they also like that our drivers are W-2 paid employees. The cars are fun to ride, and we really focus on uh, passenger experience. Question we often get with a company that used to be called The Free Ride is who pays for it? Uh, we work with transit customers like the city of San Diego, for example, um, who and Transit agencies, cities, and private developers that are looking to bridge first mile, last mile gaps between distant transit hubs uh, and distant parking lots. Uh, we then work with some of the world's biggest brands to execute experiential marketing campaigns uh, on, an in, on, an, on the inside and outside of the vehicles. Uh, the service is free, yet we're still able to turn a profit. Uh, our riders are valuable to us. They uh, help grow our customer base and provide data that makes the system smarter. Uh, the unit economics shake out too. And so we're able to grow the customer base in a more sustainable way. 2018 was a great year. Revenues were in the seven figures. Advertising sales were up 47% from the year before. And uh, transit dollars or transportation contracts are up over 100% from last year. We've signed four new city contracts in the last six month, months with several more on the line. There's a big opportunity ahead of us on both the transportation and advertising side. Um, Hollywood, Florida, for example, recently contracted with us for about $900,000 a year. Uh, the solution is more effective and less expensive than their old option. Um, to put it in perspective, Hollywood, Florida is the 163rd largest city in the U.S. We're winning out against our competitors because our service is uh, focused on this short distance, but uh, also more cost effective and more uh, eco-friendly than other options. We're also winning for other reasons like job creation and accessibility. We have a great team. Uh, my business partner, James Mirrors and I uh, are led by my business partner, James Mirrors and I. Uh, we have a team of 10 at the corporate level and have created over 150 jobs. There's now over 80 cities okay. looking at our service. Well done. Let's Thanks. give them a round of applause. I know many of you know and use InVision already. It's the product design platform used by thousands of startups and by 100% of the Fortune 100. Well, They've just introduced something that will help you streamline your workflow from design all the way to development and everything in between. Envision for Startups is what they call it, and it gives you a full suite of Envision tools, all packaged with startups in mind. And this includes unlimited accounts for collaboration. So everybody in your company gets to participate in the new designs that are on their way to the developers. And you get enterprise level security, you need not worry about getting hacked. You need not worry about anybody stealing your beautiful, brilliant new designs. Fresh, creating a simple freehand drawing using the Envision tool, and he's signing up for Envision for the first time. Easy peasy by going to envision.com twist. And he can make an iPhone mock-up in just minutes. 
Envision makes it so easy for you to learn how to make beautiful mock-ups with guided tutorials and a template library. All the templates are there. So if you're going to do an iPhone 10 or an Android phone, or you're going to use a tablet, they're going to start you on second base, third base. You're going to easily be able to fill in these templates. And I think being able to do wireframes, being able to design products with Envision, it makes you instantly hireable and super important inside of your own organization. No need to reinvent the wheel. You can simply take inspiration from existing designs that are right there in their template library and turn them into your own. So get in there, envision.com slash twist. That's envision.com slash twist, and you will get Envision for startups. It's a great price, unlimited users, and you can streamline your workflow with all that great enterprise level security and support. Get out of chat rooms, get out of IRC, get out of email threads that never end, and get on Envision. It will make your life amazing. Okay. Speaking of amazing and making your life amazing, let's get back to this amazing episode. Okay. Uh, obviously, I'm the third uh, or fourth investor in Uber from what I understand. And so I have a lot of um, passion and knowledge for the space and transportation. You rely on the city to underwrite it and advertise. So you need both of those in order to make this work, correct? We don't need both. Okay. Um, and when we look at our business, there's a whole customer base that we would call transit customers. Um, so that could people be- People who take the bus. People who pay for the bus. Got it. Um, but that can also be private developers too. We've seen a lot more customers in that space as well. So I have a building I'm putting out up or a, co a college campus or something. And instead of having uh, a bus, I have these little go-karts. What do you call these little go-kart type cars? We call them shuttles. What are they called in the industry? Uh, it's not a shuttle. A shuttle would make people think of a shuttle from the airport to the uh, car rental, and that would be a van. These are not vans. These are look like golf carts or gem cars. Is there? They are gem cars. Yeah, they're gem cars. Yep. Is, now, gem car. When you say gem car, is that a brand? Gem is a yeah. It's a subsidiary of Polaris, oh. um, Global Electric Motors. Got it. And they're normally classified as uh, low speed vehicles, LSVs. What's the top speed on that vehicle? Twenty five miles an hour. Okay, so it's slow. Yeah. Uh, so if you were going to go a distance greater than five miles, this does not work. That's not our service. Sweet spot is what distance? One to two. Perfect. So, so longer than you want to walk. Yeah. Most people will walk 10 blocks, but they'll want to look for an option after a half mile. But if it was over two miles, they would get it in Uber or Lyft. Yep. Got it. Okay. So now we know who you're going after, which means it's got to be a dense, uh, but not so dense city which means like a town or like Miami or Florida we, places. Los, Los Angeles sounds good, except if you're going from one neighborhood to another. So Santa Monica, good, but Santa Monica to Culver City, not good. You got it. Yep. So uh, the main, the sweet spot would be making a connection between, uh, in San Diego, there's a lot of underutilized parking lots on the periphery of the city. So people can park there. They're not driving around looking for parking um, or connecting with What do you pay people stations? per hour currently? You, you made a big deal of throwing shade at the 1099 world in your deck. Uh, so let's get to it. What do you pay people per hour? Um, I can't disclose exact numbers. Oh, okay. So you're so proud of that that you can throw well, shade at everybody else, and it's a big difference for you, but you can't say what it, you actually pay people. In San Diego, um, we pay a living wage. Which is what? Which is- Above 20 or below 20? Below 20. Okay. So that means you're probably in that $15 an hour range or whatever, so more than you would make at the Apple store. Or similar to Apple Store and Starbucks? I, I don't know exactly what they make it in they Apple Store. They make 12 store. to 15, I think. Okay. Yeah. So somewhere in that range. That's fair, yeah. Okay. So uh, that's fine. I'm busting your chops a little bit about throwing shade. Some people want a full-time job. Some people don't. You yep. are offering people, what's the largest number of hours a week a driver works for? Are they all 40-hour week drivers? They no, work standard shifts? Normally 40 hours a week. Um, some it. people will do it part-time um, okay. as a, a second job. So Viva La Difference, there might be some people who want to work on demand. Um, of course. Yeah, and some who don't. So the people who work on demand might get to work Friday and Saturday nights and make 30 bucks an hour and not work Monday and Tuesday, but yours get to work Monday through Friday and get a predictable salary. So that's great. Sure. What does it cost you to do a ride? How many rides an hour occur in these? And is it like a pool-like service where they drop people off on the way or go out of their way? How do you deal with that issue? Because yeah, so it looks like you can fit eight people in there. There's six passengers. Six, um, well, five it. passengers and a driver, six ah, people. Three rows of two. Correct. Um, so the, the service and the load really varies a lot by each municipality. Yeah. And, um, I think one of the benefits, but also challenges of the business is that we really try to tailor the service to fit the needs of a very 
specific area and community. Ah. Um, so load times, you know, for example, when a ferry comes in in Brooklyn um, could be a lot higher than they Got would it. be during the middle of the day on a Wednesday in downtown San Diego. Got it. And what is the, how do you charge for the advertising? We have a, a company called Rapify in our portfolio sure. that wraps cars, but these are civilians' cars and they do ad campaigns uh, around uh, different cities. But you have these permanent and they look like they have a lot of advertising space on them. So what do you charge and how do you charge? So the it does depend a little bit by market, like almost sure. everything in this business. Um, but it's normally charged on a per car per four per four week basis, uh, and then we do some add ons as well. We really try to create an experience. So some companies like Vita Coco we work with, uh, people get a product sample with it. So there's obviously oh. upcharging for the add ons and extensions. What would be the range the 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 range, the median that I would pay if I wanted to have ten of these cars in a city with this weekend startups on them, let's say. We could probably a, work work out a deal well, on that I mean, one. But, uh, what I'm trying to get at is the actual <laughs> business, not like the deal you'll give me. So what would be the median cost? Is it ten thousand a month per car, it, twenty thousand? It's less than that. It's normally between five and twelve is, is a ballpark. But again, very you know So if I could put ten cars on the road in Brooklyn or Miami or wherever, uh in Palm Beach if I put 10 on the road for 7K, I could spend $70,000 and have these cars everywhere. Yep. You get a certain amount of goodwill because people are getting into a Mercedes dealership or Coca-Cola dealership. Um, but it's a, is, do people consider it expensive or affordable or somewhere in between? What was the feedback you've gotten? So it's it's interesting. A lot of times doing 10 with a bigger ticket item is perceived as less expensive because mm -hmm. uh, you really create a saturation effect in the market. Um we actually we just won a gold award from the outdoor media, the outdoor advertising association of America, um, where they we worked with Vita Coco and they actually tied it with other billboards and things they had going in the area. So wow. it was a full saturation within that um, with the within that wheelhouse. Um, but there's also a big CSR play, like you said. So um, the goodwill. Explain giving, what CSR is. Uh, corporate and social responsibility. So right. giving back to the community. Uh, Qualcomm is a big employer in San Diego, for example. Yes, they are. Yeah. They wrap a lot of cars downtown, um, and wow. there's been a lot of other examples like that too. Interesting. And can you do these during something like a convention and have them sponsored at Comic-Con by, I don't know, Avengers or something? And have you had any of those kind of like event based? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we uh, we do Comic-Con in San Diego every year. It's, it's a big event for us. Um, we've also done the Rose Bowl in the past. Um, we've done uh, San Diego Charger Games, um, Art Basel. There's been a lot of other events. Here's a crazy idea, and I'm sure you've thought about it. What if you just charged a dollar per ride, some little amount that gave people skin in the game? Would that work better, and have you tested it, than making it free? So we have looked at some models. Yeah. Um, we haven't done it. Um, I think making it free is what boosts ridership. And when you're looking at our other customers, both transit customers are looking at what the cost per rider is compared mm -hmm. to other modes of mass transit, for example. Um, and when you're looking at advertisers, they want to see a lot of turnover and a lot of people using it. So um, by adding a dollar price tag, sure, we'd see that revenue, but we might lose some value on the other two bigger customers. Has there been a city that has bus routes or something that's underutilized and very expensive retire a bus route and then put in your solution. Hollywood Perfect. is a good example. We just started a service in Hollywood, Florida, uh -huh. um, where they had a service um, that was being underutilized because people didn't want to walk to it and walk from it. Um, Last and, mile problem. Exactly. Yeah. How long is the wait in Hollywood typically? So if I call it, am I waiting 20 minutes, 10 minutes? Normally about seven or eight. Okay. Um, so a lot longer than an Uber or Lyft, three times longer, but it's free. But it's free. Uh, and it could be a lot less. Um, but yeah, I would, it's, it's free and it's a, it's, a, it's a different type of service that can also be flagged down too. Um, so oh, really? You You're allowed one, to flag it down? In, in certain areas we can. Obviously oh, not in right. Brooklyn, but yeah. um, we can in, in areas like Hollywood and in San Diego, people can actually flag it down and hop in. You know, one of the things I'm super fascinated by is that in your regions that you've gone after, the government wants you there. And in some other areas in the country, the government ha and the incumbents, let's say medallion companies, sure. have not wanted people there. So I guess you benefit from Lyft and Uber having fought this fight in a lot of locations. What are you finding when you go to a city and say, we want to give free rides? Do they say, what's that going to do to the taxi population? Is that the big objection? It, it that they're bought and sold by the medallion companies or... You know, they have a conflict of interest because they make tax 
on these rides? Right. Yeah. Um, we haven't had too much of that, mainly because we're sort of hyper focused on the zero to two mile gap. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of other benefits. And most taxi drivers don't want to go a mile. They're looking for, for longer trips. Got it. Um, and so, you know, the, the concentration on that congested small area is not normally an ideal environment for other type of services like taxis. So I looked at your competitive slide with uh, a lot of detail. Another company in Florida pitched me on this. Okay. With the same exact idea. That company's called? I, I, you know I, the name I, of it. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. You know the name of it. Um, I, I don't. There's, actually, there's a couple that have there's popped up over the years. There's a couple who are doing years. gem cars based on advertising. Yeah. Who are they? And how are they doing? Uh, I mean, I think some of them have done well in their areas. Um, Bigger I, than you or smaller? We're definitely the front runner in the space. Oh. Um, we've but won you didn't include them on your competitor slide. Why? Because I don't really think of them as a competitor. I so think... the direct competitors are not competitors. <laughs> um, they are, you know, I guess they are. They are competitors, sure. But I think that pro uh... tip from an angel. Okay. Pro tip: If you don't put your competitors on there, and I've been talking to them over email recently because they've been pitching me pretty hard, it just makes you look intellectually dishonest. Okay. Which you don't want to come across as. Right. You may consider them incompetent or not, but you want to be able to say up front in the deck, "There's two other people doing this." None of us have hit a million rides a year. We th they're in four cities, we're in 12. You want to actually do that, yeah. especially if you consider you consider yourself the number one out of the group oh, by absolutely, far. Oh, absolutely, yeah. That actually is even more reason for you to put it in. It's good to know. Because you yeah. can be like, listen, there's three or four people who are doing this. So you could say, here's the categories of companies we compete with. Uber, taking a bicycle, you know, scooting bird and, you know, breaking your wrist. And then you can have the intellectual discussion of like, you know, an Uber is eight dollars, and a Lyft is six dollars, and a Bird is four dollars, and we're free. And right. a Bird you can't do in the rain, and all these different things. Then you can blow up and say, "And there's three people who've tried this idea. One of them's out of business. We investigated it. That's your, this is your second slide. Sure. Here's why they failed. They, you know, couldn't get advertising to work. They didn't have the municipality buy-in, and they had to hit regulation. So the why now is." The, the municipalities get it. Now we're heads up with another competitor. They're in four cities, we're in 12. With your money, Jason, and a $5 million investment, we're gonna crush them because we have this, this, and this. What does gem car think of all this? And what does a gem car cost? What does that car cost, 15, 20 grand? It's a little more than 20 because we use lithium wow. batteries. Um, so expensive. It is, yeah. Um, the Can't you buy a real car for 20 grand? You, you can, but uh, fuel costs start to add up pretty quickly. Oh, um, I see. And the lithium is more upfront, but we replace them yet. Yeah, we replace them less, excuse gotcha. me. Um, the other thing I should mention too is the car, we really built everything, so the vehicles are interchangeable. Um, so while we use those cars, they work well for us now. I think we're a great speed, you know, speed to market strategy for an autonomous company if and when the technology is there. Yeah, that would be the obvious question. And autonomy is very far away. I think in this setting, you're, you're right. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well done. I'm very interested in what you're doing. A uh, big round of applause, and we'll be right back with two more companies. Thanks so much. Almost all the wealth created here in Silicon Valley in technology comes from equity, not salary. People's salaries maybe pay for their rent, but people's boats and planes and houses and vacations, that comes from equity. And we are specialists in this ourselves here at This Week in Startups and as an investor. And all of that gets tracked on something called a cap table, C-A-P, capitalization table. But they're always broken and they're always wrong. We're always having to go back and check them as angel investors uh, and make sure that the employees and everybody's getting the same uh, amount of equity that they were promised because, hey, this is compensation. It really matters. You have to get it right. But companies and attorneys are still using spreadsheets and paper certificates to issue their options and to keep track of equity. This leads to problems if these things are messed up. And they're updated so frequently with every single new hire or if you get a valuation or a new round of funding, and it leads to tons of inaccuracy. Well, Carta fixes cap tables and equity management in more than 10 thousand companies, you heard that right, and VC firms like Slack, Coinbase, Flexport, August Capital, and myself, Jason Calacanis. We have hundreds of billions of dollars in equity captured and managed perfectly by CARTA, C-A-R-T-A. And you can simplify your cap table and make sure it's perfect and not have any drama. Nobody wants cap table drama. Trust me, it is not pleasant as a founder to have to deal with that. You will get 20% off your cap table software and 409A valuations if you go to carta.com slash twist. 
C-A-R-T-A dot com slash twist. It's super affordable. It's easy to use. You're going to get 20% off at that link. C-A-R-T-A dot com slash twist. You have to get your cap table correct. Go to Carta dot com slash twist. C-A-R-T-A dot com slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Okay, next up is Build Stream. Again, these companies are all from Urban X, which is a an accelerator that Urban.us, Stonely Baptiste's uh, great venture fund, and Mini, as in the Mini Cooper, uh, that they do together. Okay, BuildStream, real-time equipment optimization, and your name is Terry, and you're from Leeds. That's correct, yep. Is that where The Clash is from? <clears throat> I'm not quite sure, actually. It's you're in English, but you don't know where The Clash is from. Yeah, sorry, before my time. I don't know. They say, they mention <laughs> Leeds. Okay, here we go. Is that a fancy place, or is that like coming from Brooklyn? No, it's, uh, yeah, it's not the fanciest. It's quite industrial. Quite industrial. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Here we go. Three, two, go. Hey, everybody. I'm Terry Clark, the CEO and co-founder of BuildStream, and we do real-time analytics for civil engineering projects. And we have a particular focus on their heavy equipment and their logistics assets. So that's things like excavators, site trucks, and bulldozers. And the reason that we focus there is because they're very expensive, um, they're inefficient, uh, their average utilization is around 20%, and they're mission critical. You need to know where your equipment is when it's arriving to site, and the health of it as well. Failure to do that can make your projects run over time and over budget. And we focus on big infrastructure projects. And uh, we have an example here of, of one of our first customers. It's a multi-billion dollar new road construction. Now, in this particular case, they had over 3,000 pieces of equipment that they're using and more than 50 uh, suppliers of equipment. They were trying to get their data from the fleet so that they could optimize the use. And it was taking them more than five days to get the data. That's because it's in legacy systems like uh, spreadsheets, proprietary platforms, and emails, and they're unable to get it live. So that's what we solve initially with BuildStream. We automate the data capture process using IoT and our mobile app. We connect to the logistics assets, the equipment on site, and then also the site teams, and we feed all that data into our central platform where we organize it, we clean it, and we analyze it, and then we feed real-time insights to head office teams and to the site teams. And it looks like this. It's um, one central platform to manage all the operations across. And for the people who are listening, we're looking at an iPad in one of those tough cases, a map, and some of the equipment, and the equipment yep. um, that has moved around on the map. Yeah. So it's a real-time view of all the assets, and uh, the supply chain feeds into this through our API. With uh, BuildStream in place, they get their data insights in seconds rather than having to wait days for the suppliers to provide it manually. And the market here is around a trillion dollars every year is spent on earthworks globally. And there's more than 10,000 large uh, construction pro uh, companies that we can work with that we're targeting. And there's no real-time solution in the market yet. We generate revenue through subscription fees. That's charged for the software platform and our, our IoT that we install on the equipment. In the future, we'll link in a marketplace for equipment rentals, which we'll charge commission on. Once we're mature, we can reach $2,000 per asset per year of revenue. Once we hit 50K assets on the platform, we're a $100 million ARR business, and we feel we can hit that by 2024. And we sell directly to the general contractor right now, and that's working well. It generates a nice network effect. They're beginning to ask us to link in their supply chain partners, such as rental companies, OEMs, and subcontractors, who we also charge SaaS subscriptions to. And <clears throat> BuildStream is the only company in the market that has an OEM agnostic hardware solution and that is providing real-time analytics that also accounts for the supply chain complexity problem. Existing solutions in the market are point-to-point -point with one use case uh, in mind, and we're actually being asked to integrate with these systems by our customers now. And we're growing really fast. Uh, last year, this was a concept. We came to UrbanX uh, with one uh, trial customer, and we've grown from zero to 2,000 assets under management since November. We're on target to hit 30,000 by the end of the year and with 10X revenue since February. And we just pre-sold the first 200 of our IoT units. Okay, very well done. Let's give him a big round of applause. All right. Um, so working backwards, uh, when you started showing the assets under management, yep. I when I see AM, AUM, I think assets under management, but I think you probably have like, I thought it meant originally like maybe 2,000 a month in revenue. I was trying to figure this out. So when you see a company that uses a metric other than revenue or a number of customers, mm -hmm. you immediately think as an investor, but they will not tell you this, but you want me to tell you what they actually yeah. think? Because we, you want the red pill, the blue pill. Red. 
You take the red pill. Perfect. Okay. So they just think, oh, they don't have revenue. This isn't a real business. But I think you have revenue. Yeah, we do. And so I always like to, but you probably have a modest amount of revenue and you might even be a little self-conscious about it. I always think it's best for the founder and the entrepreneur to put the number out there because the right investors have invested in companies that have $5,000 a month in revenue, like Mm -hmm. com.com did when we invested. And it's our job to envision it going 100x to 500,000 and then watching that number go 10x and then 10x again, Mm -hmm. which is what happened with com.com. They have over 100 million in revenue according to press reports and what they've said publicly. So it's our job to do that. So what, what does the revenue look like? What did you do in the first quarter? Yeah, so since February, we've generated $8,000 per month in revenue. Great. The next question we're going to want to charge it, we're going to want to know is exactly how you charged for that. So is it per um, dump truck or shovel? What, I don't know what they call those excavators or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Is it by item? Is it by day? How do you charge? So for or these, are you still figuring it out? Yeah, we're figuring that out. These are okay. paid trials right now. In the future, it will scale per asset on the platform. Got it. So what I like here is that you're doing paid trials. Most people are scared to do paid trials. Why are most people scared? Well, humans are driven by fear, right? It's a large part of how we survived as a species and became the dominant species on the planet was we were fearful when other people were stupid and got eaten by apex predators. But um, you are not scared. You put the product out there. You got people to actually agree on a price Mm -hmm. of and how many unique customers did you have last month? One, 10? We're working with four now, but they're big like mul- hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. Companies. Perfect. So you have four people who are using it, uh, who are paying you. Yeah. And then the next question you're going to get from qualified investors, I'm talking about the smart ones, is how did you source each one of them? Now, you were in the construction business before this, or your family was? Yeah. I've okay. Been, yeah. You were? Yeah. Was your family? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, th- I'm not, I wasn't given this information, okay. but you see how I guess every data point in the previous presentations, Mm -hmm. it's because we see patterns as investors. This is one of the great patterns. Somebody has skin in the game and they got unfinished business. You got unfinished business because your parents worked in this. You may even have like a little bit of a rough relationship with your pop. (laughs) He might not have been the greatest, but I don't want to get, he might have been a little tough on you growing up in Leeds and when you were working with him in the construction business. It's my mom that's the uh, Oh, your mom was tough on you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So dad gave you the love and mom gave you the (laughs) the stick? Okay, anyway, either way, you show me a great founder, I'll show you a dysfunctional relationship with one or both parents. Um, But here's the thing. You're fitting a pattern of somebody who's not scared to charge for it. And the next question you get is you're gonna get unit economics. So that's where you can actually, instead of going for these big numbers, which I understand is important, and I understand that's the Y Combinator way, total addressable market. Be prepared for people who want to really drill in and get super detailed on those four customers. They're going to want to know how you source them. The first two are people you worked with before or your friends. Mm-hmm. The next two, maybe you cold called or was a referral. I'm taking a guess here. You tell me. Uh, no, it's okay. Yeah, we're working with one of uh, Europe's biggest infrastructure projects that was from previous connections. It took a long Perfect. time to get through that. Yeah. Got it. So that's another great thing about your past. So you can own that as well. What uh, some rookie founders will do is they'll kind of obscure the fact that their first couple of customers came from a connection. It's actually something to embrace. It mm-hmm. means you have connections in the field and you can get yourself to start on second or third base. A major project decided to give you 8000 a month. Is that right? Or it's 8000 a year? No, it's 2000 to 3000 per month per customer. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so we're starting to sort of build this model. The other thing I would do, and I'm really attracted to your business, I thought the competitive slide was super uh, helpful for me because that was going to be a lot of my questions. What's a competitive landscape? And you did a great job on this one because we know Cat and Hitachi and all these people, they have their own proprietary systems to try to figure this out. Yeah, yeah. But that means some general contractors got to have four different dashboards. Yep. That doesn't work. And then we know there's fleet tracking companies um, as well, but that's kind of like one dimensional, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's IoT platforms, of course, but you're trying to build something that works across all of this equipment and, yep. and normalizes it, which mm-hmm. I think is really smart. But you do have a hardware product. Yeah, we do. Is Tell me about that product because you didn't mention it. Yeah, so... What does it track exactly? So it tracks the the working state of the equipment. So whether it's working, moving, or idle, and exactly where it is. And we're able to do it in real time. So, that so you got mean, a GPS, an accelerometer, and a 5G connection in it. 
Yeah, well, it's two, three, or four G at, at the moment. Yeah, oh, four G rather. Yeah, I'm sorry. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you have a four G connection. So these things cost uh, three or four hundred bucks to put in each one. Well, yeah, we're, we're trialing it at the minute. We're just building the first few, but we we get the cost down to around hundred dollars per unit. Yeah, so yeah. three or four hundred now, and yeah, yeah. at scale down to a hundred. Yeah. So it's just an Arduino and kind of yeah. Yeah, or actually, you probably use a mobile processor because the battery will last longer. You can actually do it on an Android phone, I bet. Well, we 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 tested that out in our first trials, actually. Ah. Yeah, we use it use an Android to um to film what was happening we, and we then analyze ah. the uh, the video to is see. Is that it. another piece that people want is cameras on the tip of the... In some cases, yeah. There's a little bit of um, pushback from the operators. but oh, that's liability? For productivity tracking sometimes. They're, they're a bit scared of change. They operate, this is the people operating the equipment. Oh, they don't want to be videotaped. Sometimes, yeah. They get over it. But I mean... Our... I mean, if you're from England, I mean, you have more CCTV in England than any <laughs> other country. Yeah, we do. You mean you're giving uh, well, China a run China. for their money, yeah. I think it's neck and neck. Um, this is fantastic. I think it's going to work, uh, and I think it's going to be hard. But one other tip I'll give you in the in these kind of decks is really lean into an example. So you left it up to me to imagine how this would work on a bulldozer mm -hmm. and what metrics you're tracking. If I was giving this, I'd say, "Hey, I'm Jason Calacanis. Uh, I am the CEO of Buildstream. This is my co-founder Terry. He doesn't talk. Um, here's what we do: we build this little device. It's got an accelerometer." It's got GPS and it's got a camera. Uh, and now if we put this into your bulldozer, uh, we know exactly where it is on site. And we've got a fancy GPS that tells us really a little bit closer than a normal one. We know the speed. We know how many hours it's operating. And here's what's interesting. Imagine you had 100 of these on 10 different sites. We can show you the percentage utilization. And what you'll find out is that you have 100 dump trucks, but you're actually using this many dump trucks. And if you had this site open on Saturday and Sunday, it would actually make sense for you to drive the dump trucks over there rather than leave them unused for four days here mm -hmm. or whatever insight, right? Yeah. And so that is what people do. It's, it's one thing to throw a bunch of sensors on anything, mm -hmm. on your wrist, on your dump truck, on your car, on your bicycle, on your skis, on your helmet, on your motorcycle. People are putting sensors everywhere. What do you get out of it will determine the churn level and the amount people are willing to pay for your software solution. Mm -hmm. So what are people willing to pay for Fitbits and Apple Watches? A couple hundred bucks, which for an individual is a decent amount. Mm -hmm. um, and these things have become super addictive. What are they willing to pay for you know, their bicycle to have one? If they're a serious bicyclist, they'll buy that, what is it, Stravia? Stravia? Strava, yeah. Strava. They'll buy Strava and they'll pay a $20 a month fee or whatever for the advanced one. So that's what you have to sort of um, do for your customers and I think also for your potential investors is convince them that the, it's worth recording all this stuff, it's worth the expense, and here is what behavior the GM did. So I'm going to give you one more chance at this. What's the number one insight a GM had that you didn't expect so far? Take a minute to think about it. What's the number one insight um, a, it, a, it, a, I'm sorry, a GC, a yeah. general contractor, yeah, yeah. gave you? It was the effect that ground conditions has on the productivity of the excavators. So when it's raining yeah. or wet or dry, it has an impact? What was it specifically? Yeah, and, and the type of soil as well. So if it's clay and it's wet, that's up to oh. 10 times harder to work in. So that really affects their productivity, which affects their deadlines. So they're Got actually it. using it as an evidence point to go back and say, look, it was raining on this day. We know it's clay ground. That gives them sort of leverage to, to plan better. Ah, so now you could plug in a weather API. We've got that, yeah. You have done it already. Yeah. And so here now, this last 30 seconds of the discussion, your credibility went through the roof because now I'm thinking, oh, this cat from Leeds figured it out. He's talking to the GCs and they're giving him feedback on what they learned from his, and he incorporated it very quickly back into the product to say, hey, you had three inches of rain. You had two inches of rain. You had six inches. You should just call it. There is no reason for people to go to work when there's six inches mm -hmm. of rain because the, these things don't work. Look, yep. here's the 10 days when you had six inches or more of rain, and here's the 10 days you had six inches and less. Six inches or less, worth coming to work. Over six inches, not worth it. And they can make a better decision to save money yep. and time, and that's when you really have a great business 
Wow, what a great idea. Terry, I wish you great success on it, and we'll be right back on This Week in Startups. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and I got to meet with four amazing companies today. You saw, you saw Toggle from Dan, Toggle.is. He's doing construction, robotics with the rebar on the concrete. Circuit, RideCircuit.com. We saw the co-founder, Alex Esposito, explain to me the advertising plus municipality model for his little gem car startup. Very cool. And Buildstream. Terry Clark coming hard from Leeds with a really interesting real-time heavy equipment optimization IoT platform. Really great stuff. You can see all of these businesses going on to change the world, in fact. Next up is Baro. Rodrigo is the co-founder. And you're batting clean up here, the fourth startup, but it was picked at random. You have three minutes on the clock. Remember, people are listening, so if you're going to describe something on the screen, don't just say, as you see here. Say, as you can see here, our car is driving down the street. Are you ready? Copy that. Three, two, go. Hi, everybody. I'm Rodrigo de Guzman. I'm the founder and CEO of Baro. Baro is the future of EV ownership. By the year 2030, there'll be as many EVs on the road as there are households in the US, and the auto manufacturers are spending $300 billion to produce those 125 million units. At the same time, technology is changing how we get cars and how we think about getting cars. Once upon a time, you'd go to the dealership and spend all day there, and now everyone expects to get some kind of car on their phone. And that, that creates the perfect storm of confusion for the potential EV buyer. First, dealers don't really do a great job at selling gas-powered cars. That experience is even worse for EVs. If you go to the dealership to buy an EV, they're often covered with dust, hidden on the lot, not charged. And new EVs depreciate at a higher rate than gas-powered cars. For the buyer, they have so many questions about EV ownership that they're, they're reluctant to commit to years of monthly payments. They want to know if they can take it on a road trip. They want to know if it works for the daily commute. And if you try to take an EV out for a long-term test drive, that doesn't exist. Until now. Borrow with just a few clicks makes it easy to get into the EV of your choice for terms of three, six, or nine months. A user simply comes to our website, selects the car they want, where they want it, and their term, and we take care of delivery, insurance, maintenance, and charging. And it's working. We've grown the fleet from 11 to 50, and now we have reservations for 500, all in our home market of Los Angeles and all in just the last four months. And with 125% weekly growth, now is the perfect time to expand. And California is the perfect expansion market. 50% of all EVs in the US are in California. And our target market is all over the place in California. It's millennials, it's college students, it's EV enthusiasts, and it's empty nesters. And we reach those, and we, we reach and acquire those customers at a cost of sixty-eight dollars, which is one tenth the cost of the auto industry. And globally, EV adoption is off the charts. The worldwide market is eight billion dollars, and we're going after two and a half billion. The U.S. market is two billion, and we're going after five hundred million. And in Southern California alone. There were 13,000 off-lease EVs come in 2018, and with 753 reservations, we're poised to get 6% of that market all by Thanksgiving. People now want cars from as short as five minutes to as long as five years. And people come to borrow because we make it quick, easy, and convenient to get a car for the time period that's totally underserved. We created the market, and we own that time, time period between three months and two years. Because we own that market, it's no surprise that we've got a lot of momentum right now. We have reservations for 500 cars, we're expanding to seven markets, and we'll have $20 million in ARR all in the next 12 months. And we've assembled the perfect team to conquer this business. As a founding team, we have 75 years of experience in marketing, fintech, and automotive. And as founders, John and I bring over 25 years as operators and five exits between us. And that's Borrow. All right, well done. Let's give him a big round of applause. OK, red pill or blue pill? Blue pill. Okay, blue pill. That no, blue pill mean, means I'm just totally sugarcoat everything. I don't need. You're sugar. amazing. <laughs> this is great. Everything's awesome. It's like I'm talking to my you. Mom. Win everything. Red pill is they unpl You see the movie The Matrix? Long time ago. Yeah. So you know when he, spoiler alert, when he wakes up and he realizes he's in a bathtub full of goo and he's just living like a hallucination. Yeah. When he takes the red pill, he gets to come out of that matrix and see what's really happening. Do your best. Okay, here we go. Um, so, I am an EV enthusiast. You know this. Me too. But you know I am. You know yes, I own I, four Teslas. Oh, I know you definitely own at least one because you said it earlier today. Exactly. Um, and not only do I own one, I own four. I own all four Teslas. You and have a Roadster. I have the 16th Roadster ever made. I have the first 
Model S ever released to the public. The signature is serial number 0001. I have an X, and I have a founder series of the three. three that Elon gave to me before it was even available. So I am a super enthusiast. And nowhere in this pitch do you ever mention Tesla. And so this is called cognitive dissonance. Have you heard that term in psychology before? Cognitive yeah. dissonance? I'll say yes, and I'm not going to explain it. So what? Okay. Saying? So anyway, cognitive dissonance is a super important one. It means you have two conflicting ideas in your head, and it causes you anxiety, and it forces your brain to pick which one, uh, which idea you're going to go with typically, because people can't keep two conflicting ideas. So for some people, it might be, oh, my dad beat me, and I love my dad. For other people, it might be like, Oh my God, Trump is president. I hate being an Amer. I love America. What do I do, right? So there's this cognitive dissonance that can occur. Oh, the Mueller report came out and he's exonerated, but I hate Trump and I think he's a criminal. Which one am I going to decide, right? And so when you make claims in a deck, it's up to you as the founder um, to understand what dissonance you might cause. And so there was some early dissonance here. You said the problem. You have to be very careful with the problem uh, that you state because in the, the first thing you stated was how bad it is to buy an EV. I've bought four of them. It is easier to buy a Tesla than it is to buy any other car in the world. You don't negotiate the price. You put in $500 online. You pick everything. I ordered my last Tesla in under 10 minutes. It was the easiest thing I've ever done. I've had Instacart and good eggs orders that took longer than ordering my Tesla. I'm not kidding. So when you start out with that kind of dissonance, now I'm like, oh, I got to catch up here and try to believe the rest of the deck. Then you were talking about how these deprecate in cost, or I'm sorry, depreciate in cost at a higher rate. That's not true for Teslas. The Model 3, there's only like four of them for resale right now. Um, the Model S's, the X's, they get actually really good prices. So yeah, I think absolutely. you're talking about non-Teslas. That's right. So to have an EV deck that doesn't mention Tesla just creates massive dissonance. So let's we just- We don't actually mention a single maker model, although Tesla's- Oh no, you did. You, Tesla's part of our lineup. No, no, you showed the showed, BMW. You also right. showed on that logo slide uh, of like how often people use a car from five minutes or whatever. You had a bunch of different car well, those, brands. That's our competitive slide. Yeah, yeah. On the competitive side, there was a bunch of different things. So I think you have to mention the impact of Tesla here on this. Okay. Now, are Tesla's part of this or no? Tesla is part of our lineup. They're my two dragons, I call them. You have two in the right. Right. We have a um, fleet of 50 and two Teslas. Perfect. And so I think you have to kind of include Tesla in this or else the the kind of model breaks. Right. I don't definitely don't want to lose people at the beginning. So no. I hear you. So what is how does Tesla factor in this in the Model 3? Right. So we buy all of our cars off lease. Got it. So as soon as the cars have reached the appropriate age when they're off lease, about two years. We'll include them in our lineup. Mm -hmm. So the next few cars we're going to add are the Chevy Bolt, which I think is a great car from dollar for dollar. That's a great car. Yep. Kia Soul EV, and then the Model 3. Got it. Um, Model S is what we have. You have some Model we S's. We have two Model S's. S's. Yeah. What do you charge? That's the other thing that didn't... Yeah. We didn't have unit economics in here at all. So I was trying to That's figure right. that. And so I'll talk to you about every price in our lineup, yeah. and then the unit economics is a slightly different question. Yeah. So the we have four categories of car. The campus categories are least are most affordable mm. at one hundred and ninety nine dollars a month, and the shorter you keep it, the more expensive it goes. So it goes from one ninety nine to two ninety nine, and then um, the. So if I take it for a month. So our minimum term is three months, okay. and if you want a car for three months, it's a, a city car. Sorry, a smart car. It's two ninety nine a month for three months. Got it. The city category is a Fiat five hundred e, and it starts at three ninety nine and goes up to four ninety nine. Got it. And then we have the premium category, which is the BMW i3, 524 to 624. And the Tesla Model S is $1099 for nine months, $1299 for six months, and $1499 for three months. Per month or for the whole? Per month. month. Per month. No down payment, no drive off, no return fee, no penalty. And no insurance. Insurance is included? Insurance is extra. Oh, okay. So. And I'll talk to you about unit economics if you still want to know about that. Yeah. So basically for 20 bucks a day, 10, 20, 30, 40 bucks a day, I can either be driving a modest car or a baller car. That's right. And I don't have to make a huge commitment. So this is something that a millennial or somebody who is traveling for business or, or is, relocating. Or in school for a while. Got it. So what is your beachhead? Who are these people who want to rent a car yeah, for three, six months? Do they want to sample the car and then buy it full time? So 18% of our customers have gone on to buy an EV. 
And they've often gone on to buy an EV that they didn't subscribe to. So they might have huh. driven a Fiat and ended up with a Nissan Leaf. Or the, actually, for a while, we had a bunch of people on the wait list for the Model 3. So, huh. And they only want to drive electric. So that's one category. Those are real EV enthusiasts. And we, or we no, they're that. future EV enthusiasts. They, right. they don't have the commitment level. If they were EV enthusiasts, they would just buy it. They're potential EV enthusiasts who are... They're EV curious. They also had some FOMO that they wanted to make sure that the next model was Thank coming you out. For the people who got that, they wanted to get, they wanted to wait for the next model to come out ah. because there's a perceived improvement in battery. Got it. So they didn't want to get caught in the upgrade cycle. That's right. So they were upgrade cycle fearful. That's right. But EV curious. Yeah. And our first wave of customers were the ones that we expected: millennials who hadn't owned a car in a while. Perfect. They spent over a thousand dollars on rideshare didn't know how to get insurance for it. So we help them with all of that. So millennials who don't know how to act like adults That's right. is the next category. So yes. commitment phobic millennials. Right. They don't like to own things. Right. They also don't want long commitments. And they don't want to fill out paperwork or do anything right. arduous and as an adult. There's no paper in our process, which is a different topic. Absolutely. No, um, it's a critical one. They want yeah. to press a button. That's right. So buying a car for them has to be as easy as Instacart or less. Right. 15 minutes and they're out the door with our service. Amazing. Reminds me of Silver Car. You wear Silver Car, the rental? That's from Audi, right? I think it might be Volvo's or it might be Audi, I but I think Audi. it's a startup. Yeah. And I, That's I rent a car. at the airport, right? They're off airport, beautiful cars. You order from the app. It's just easy breezy and like the pricing is like yours, like simple. So I do think there's something there. Is this a, I guess the criticism you'll receive is, isn't this like a transitional thing? If you really convince people that EVs are the future, they go buy one. So you lose them as a customer. 18%. Yeah. So you lose one out of five to that. Is there a way to keep them? Right. So our longest, our average term is 5.2 months, first huh. of all. And then our longest serving customer actually did two nine-month subscriptions. Huh. We've only been doing this for less Back to back two. or concurrent? Back to back. Huh. So that's, we've only been doing this for 22 months. So Got that it. has been a customer from the beginning. Hmm. If they do the math later, they may conclude that perhaps they made a mistake, right? So, huh. I mean, our, our model is predicated on this notion of three months to nine months, and you can renew as much as you want after that. Do you have people who are enthusiasts? Because I saw a pitch when I was in Miami recently. I forgot the name of the company, but they were doing this for more exotic cars, $1,000 a month. And every three months, you- You could you, switch out a car. You could every four, yeah, you, four cars a year or six car a year plan, 1,000 or 1,500 a month kind right. of thing. And you would go from a Model X to a, you know, B, it wasn't just EVs, but you, it, yeah. you could go to a Maserati, whatever. And, and so a lot of the car manufacturers are approaching the market with that model, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at Porsche and Porsche Passport, they have a category where you pay $3,000 a month. You can switch from a 911 to a Cayenne to a Panamera. Oh, really? How is that going for them? I don't think it's going well because what we've seen is that customers don't actually want to switch cars every month. The idea of yeah. switching a car is often um, creates a lot of anxiety for people. For me I, alone, I know just taking the stuff out of my trunk, it's going to take a minute. Yeah. So the idea of not having my car for a while, um, the, no the notion I think is getting more press than the actual reality of changing cars. Got it. And then you have to create an unlimited amount of inventory to do it. That's really expensive. Why are you limiting yourself to EVs? I'm curious. So we're in EVs for two reasons. One is the unit economics are great. So for a Fiat, for example, we buy that for $8,100. Even with uh, So those ones de depreciate at a high clip. So our depreciation that we've seen, we sold a few cars, yeah. is anywhere between one and one and a half percent per month. We keep the car for about 12 to 15 months. Mm. So with the depreciation, plus the cost to hold the car if it's financed, minus adding in the revenue from the car, that unit economic is 32% for that mm. car. So, and the longer we hold it, it depreciates more, but we'll also earn more in subscription. Yeah. And in order for us to buy an $8,100 gas power car, it's probably going to be a tin can that we won't be able to charge $449 a month for. It's not going to be a great car. That's right. Yeah. It's fascinating. Hmm. That's the first aspect of it. Yeah. The second aspect is EVs are perceived, and I'm a believer in this, and you are probably too, EVs are perceived as luxury. They are. Because of the technology aspects of it, they're, you know, people think that I'm smarter, I'm better, I'm more, more luxurious. Well, they I'm drive faster. They're zippier. They have better acceleration and typically they have better software. I mean, at least on the Tesla side, I don't know about the other ones, but my Tesla updates the software now every month, sometimes every two weeks. And you're like, oh, what's it's like get it's like an iPhone. Like you go to the app store and you're like, oh, look, Spotify has new some new feature or my podcasting app has a new feature. You just feel like you're 
you're getting more value every time. Do the Fiat's and those other ones upgrade as as violently as the uh, Teslas? Do? I mean, not, not nothing's quite like a Tesla. As That's we true, know, yeah. right? Um, yeah. But those cars are great quality, and people love them. Mm. I think you're going to have a lot of Teslas coming off market. The Model right. S's, yeah. Uh, the Model S's because the Model Three is so good and so um, fun to drive because it's a little bit of a smaller footprint. It's kind of like a little bit of a Porsche. It mm-hmm. reminds me of like the Porsche, what was the little cheap Porsche they made? Like the, the Boxster. Boxster. It reminds me of a Boxster in how zippy it is and how fun to drive. Okay. Or a Jetta, you know, like okay. I don't know if they make Jettas anymore. The old Saabs yeah. that they used to have that were like the convertibles. Like it's got that zippiness to it. That's fun. So I think a lot of S owners are going to downgrade to a three. I did because I'm alone in the car ninety. 90- Eight percent of the time, and it, it's just nicer to be in a smaller car when you're alone. Right. I like it. All right, listen, it's a very interesting business. I wish you success with this, and we'll be right back. All right, we got to see four great companies, and my friend Stanley Baptiste is here back on the program. Congratulations. Good companies. Thank you. Um, how did you source the companies? So um, little little known, not, not very well kept secret, is that having a BMW Mini as a partner, ah. uh, a top brand, two top brands yeah. in one, um, they know how to reach markets great. all around the world. And so in addition to the great relationships we have um, with uh, co-investors like yourself yeah. and, and others who send deals to us, we go to your accelerator and source yeah. deals there. We also have um, an international marketing engine and events platform that right. helps us meet companies as far as UK, um, down in LA, all across the, the country. Uh, and so we end up seeing about a little over a thousand companies a year. Hmm. Um, and from that, we get to pick the top 12 to 15 that we really love. And what do you do? You put 100K, 200K into these companies? 150K. 150K. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, moving, fo- moving forward, we're, we're putting 150K. Ah, uh, um, yeah. Well, that, uh, I as, guess as YC uh, yeah. up the ante. It was originally 100, and then I just went to 150. We do 100. We're going to have to go to 150, I guess. It, it's, it really is. Um, we, we beat on our own drum. Uh, yeah. We follow the beat of our own drum. Uh, and it just we realized we were putting more money into companies, uh, you know, getting through the program based on the kind of companies that we were starting to attract. Yeah. Uh, and we just figured we would just bump the upfront. Got it. Yeah. Um, is it a standard deal for a standard percentage or is it variable? Uh, it is variable. Uh, it. We take into consideration the fact that some companies are further along, um, need more or less resources, et cetera. We're typically looking to be the first investor in a company, meeting them when it's an idea, first sort of iteration of the product. First, prototype. Yeah, prototype, first interest from customer, et cetera. But we also... Uh, like in the case of um, Circuit, um, I want to be able to work with companies that have quite a bit of traction, um, but still could use our help. And we want to have flexibility to still be able to work with them. Do they all have to be transportation services? Because today we had a free shuttle service. We had construction robotics. That's outside of it. And the other two were also in transportation and cars in, in uh, some way. Uh, so the answer is no, because one of the reasons why we're working with Mini is because they think about the city holistically. Mm. They're, they've got plenty of money and talent being invested in figuring out transportation and mobility. Um, And they're happy to see earlier stuff through our program. But what they really want to see from the partnership is what else is happening in cities? What else is interesting? Where can they be helpful? Sometimes founders are nervous about big companies. They may think, oh my God, my idea is going to get stolen. It's going to be in the next uh, Mini Cooper or something like that. Um, What is the uh, relationship around the IP? Do, do these does a big company like Mini get first shot of buying the company? Is there any special onerous um, um, clauses in the contract, as it were? Yeah, I mean this is this is actually uh, um, uh, yeah not very obvious, but we've got such a great um, partnership with them where we have all the autonomy of an independent accelerator and fund. Um, none of those, res- none of the restraints. The companies aren't signing up to sort of have any sort of first refusal with BMW on anything. Mm-hmm. They're getting their money, they're getting the resources, and they're you know the companies get. BMW to keep. gets a little bit of the. I mean, they're uh, investing alongside they're investing, us, yeah, but they don't it. have the ability to vote down a, yeah. an acquisition from a competitor. Nope. They, I they, think it's they, important they, for people to know that. Does that yeah. come up at all, or? Um, no, we're pretty transparent about ah, it, right? If, if there's anything that is looks like it might be weird, or mm-hmm. you know, BMW can opt out, or we can ask them to opt out, and we'll just mm-hmm. invest out of the fund and not do the program with Got the it. company. But 
um, where there's alignment, it's more likely that BMW just wants to be one of the first customers. But mm. no, no further than that, they, yeah. and even that is not a requirement that the company has to agree to do that. So right. it's, I mean, it's a sweetheart deal. They're, they, um, we get to leverage BMW's engineers, designers, et cetera, to help build product, but all the IP and the resulting product stays with the companies. Yeah. Uh, so we saw these companies. I think I'm going to go through it. Um, and I, I always like to challenge you to give me your three, two, one. Yeah. So, well, I, I mean, it's only fair that I it's think it's you only this fair time. that yeah. I have to do yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll just take you through my general thinking in reverse order. Obviously, we just saw a borrow. I like the idea of new ownership models. As you heard, I'm a little concerned about why limit its EVs only. Um, and I had a little cognitive dissonance, dissonance, but I really like the founder. Terry has unfinished business, and he's got a childhood uh, in the construction business with his mama. And uh, something about Terry strikes me as a hardworking, striving, blue collar, you know, grinded out person. Like not everybody wants to be in that clay and that mud, but yeah. he does. He feels yeah. comfortable there. And I always think founder product and founder market fit is as important as product market fit. So does the product like the market? Okay, that should be pretty easy to predict and it should be pretty easy to figure out at least a strategy to do that but you can't fake founder product or founder market fit the founder actually has to like big dump trucks that's that's actually the number one thing we we look for oh really yeah that yeah because if the founder's not passionate about it what happens they end up working on something else and then we're not helpful they get distracted they give yeah. up yeah exactly the free shuttle service i am fascinated with and I actually think that the advertising piece is not going to work. I think it's going to be hard because advertising is becoming so driven by um, uh, being able to close the loop, as it were. But I think the municipalities are getting such a quick education and innovation that it's possible that in every single city, the bottom 20% of bus routes lose so much money and are such dogs, but they can't be shut down because what politician is shutting down the B32 in Brooklyn and losing the votes of that community of a bunch of old people who actually go out and vote, but they're costing the city per ride? I don't know if you've seen some of these statistics, but some bus routes, you know, if they cost $100,000 to maintain a month, and they get only a thousand people. It's a hundred dollar ride. You could have put the person in an Uber or Lyft, right. and you could put them in an Uber Lux yeah. and say, have saved seventy five dollars. Right. That's I think going to be the efficiency where cities go. You know what? Enough. These three or four routes are dogs and money losers. We might as well give people who are in that community who can prove they live there a free ride to from their house to this demarcation point where the regular buses start, at the very least, let alone maybe just say, you know what, anybody trying to get out of here uh, or get back to here, $3 flat rate each way we pay to them. I think that's what's going to work. But I don't know. It's good that they have the advertising because it kind of lets them have like a little icing on the cake, as right. it were. Right. Um, and I like the founder a bit, uh, even though I had to learn the lesson of don't hide your competitors. Yeah. But that's why we're here. We're here to to figure that out because I actually been talking to one of the competitors and it was so funny because we came in I was like oh we've been talking he's like no we haven't I was like wait a second <laughs> I gotta look through my email and your first one construction robotics wow because I love Cafe X I'm right. on the board of Cafe X congratulations by the way well we're getting there yeah Let's, we're not popping champagne corks until they have a hundred locations and they're, they're about to open at SFO they'll have their fourth nice but I need it well I shouldn't even say 20 locations I'm gonna pop champagne four I really am interested to see what happens in an airport because that could be magic. Um, so I really love the idea of these, ro these robots getting cheaper and cheaper and then humans working alongside them in very deep verticals. Yeah. So given that, I am going to give third place to circuit, the free shuttle service. Although I don't think that what they think is going to be the model is going to be the model. Okay. I think the 80-20 is going to flip. I think it's going to be 80% municipalities wanting to save money and 20% advertisers getting a little icing on the cake. Yeah. I'm going to give number two. 
to my boy Terry from Leeds. I got a feeling about him. So do we. Uh, you do too. Yeah. You do too, right? Mm-hmm. You can tell. He yeah. like he it's he's got skin in the game. Like he can't fail because his mom's watching. <laughs> She's asking for updates. And then I'm going to give my number one to Dan from Construction Robotics Toggle. Now, this is not what a normal VC would do. A normal VC, I think, would be very attracted to borrow and circuit, I think. I think borrow has um, the 800-pound juggernaut of Tesla that they're going to have to figure out. And so that, to me, gives me just pause. Um, But I like the founder. And I do like the idea of the subscription model for cars. And I think everybody does. So there's mm-hmm. something there. But I think it's got to go through two or three more revs. Um, but I think Toggle, to me, is the winner for two reasons. One, I have the insight on the robots. These robotic arms are going to get cheaper and better at an alarming rate. Mm-hmm. And when, I mean, the fact that it's only $30,000 and those construction people get paid 40, 50, 60 bucks an hour, yeah. they're getting paid a lot of money. Just, just the idea that a human is going to be bending that bar and breaking their arm, losing a finger, you know, having it crack, just all kinds of nasty shit that, I'm oh, sorry, nasty stuff that happens. Beep that, please. Um, all this nasty stuff that happens that for safety reasons, we're going to live in an age where the idea that a human would be bending those rebars is going to go away. Yeah. It's just not going to be, OSHA is going to be like, yeah, don't do that. Just like OSHA is like, yeah, you know what? I think you need to get out of the tank with the killer well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the first word is killer right. and you're swimming with it. Yeah. In front of an audience. Like, going to go ahead and say, maybe you shouldn't be on stage with bears and a whip in Vegas, Siegfried and Roy. Just, what, oh, maybe. tigers. It was a tiger that took yeah. them down. Yeah. Like, going to go ahead and say, Bengal tiger? Probably not a good idea. In front of a crowd of 3,000 people and you with a whip in your hand, I'm going to go ahead and say, yeah, we don't need that. That's what we're going to look at. When we look at dangerous professions and we're like, Mm. why would a human ever be anywhere near that danger? Yeah. And that's where I think, and also what I love about it too is I think he knows that he's got to sell in to the people, not disrupt construction. He's not there to disrupt it. He's there to make it more efficient, maybe get people just 20, 30% more on time. And so selling into the construction, the general contractor, the developer, and the concrete company, I think aligning with the concrete companies would be really smart. Yeah. Really, really smart. And just saying, you know what, we're going to give you an advantage over everybody else. We'll let you, because you know some of these guys, like they might be seeing the end of the line for their concrete company or something. Maybe they want to retire. And you say, listen, if you guys use our solution, we'll let you buy equity in the next round because these construction companies have a lot of money. So you say, hey, we, like Uber did in the early days to celebrities, like, hey, you want to be the first rider, Ed Norton? We'll let you buy $10,000 of shares at the last round's price that's now worth 400000 You know, you yeah. can have a little lift or something. So anyway, very cool stuff. Thanks so much for bringing everybody and congratulations to the companies. You uh, you found a good home in uh, Urban X and um, with the team over at urban.us. Okay, we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.